Good morning, church. Well, we're so glad that you're here today. As you can see, it's a little bit different. Uh, we got uh, people wearing t-shirts on a Sunday morning. I know that that's strange, but it's because of D-Now, and we're so excited uh, what God has been doing in the lives of our students all weekend. Uh, you know, Chad is leading worship for us this morning. Him and his band had led worship for our students all weekend, and they've sacrificed a lot, and they've done a fantastic job. So thank you, Chad, and the band. And um, and then Noah, as Noah comes up, he's, he's he's been our guest speaker for the weekend, and Noah's a, a very, very close friend of mine, one of my best friends, and uh, Noah and I got to know each other through serving a church plant in New Orleans together. Um, one of the, the best preachers I know, but also one of the, the, the best um, servants I know. And he's, he's humble, he's not gonna say that about himself, uh, but he does a great job of leading and serving and, and, um, and the Lord is using him in mighty ways. Noah has just recently been uh, endorsed through the North American Mission Board and will be uh, transitioning to Boston, Massachusetts to plant a church through North American Mission Board. And he'll tell you a little bit about that as well, but we're so thankful for him. Uh, and he'll be preaching for us this morning. So Noah, take the stage, man. Love you, dude. Thanks, bro. Well, good morning. What a joy it is to be here with you and to have a chance to study God's word together. Um, I'm so excited to be here, and it's been an amazing weekend. I've uh, had just a, a great pleasure of spending some time with your students. You have great students. Uh, I know you know that, but uh, it's been a joy to get to know them and their stories and what God's doing in their life, and uh, I just thank you so much for allowing me uh, the privilege to open a God's Word with them this weekend and again to do that this morning. Uh, as Dallas said, um, my wife and I, we were in seminary in New Orleans and got to know Dallas at a church plant there. We were serving together, and God God does that thing where he uh, changes your plans a little bit. We didn't intend to do church planting, let alone to go to the city of Boston, uh, but God has uh, called us to go to that city uh, and this summer uh, start the process of planting a church there. So we are excited, uh, and I just want to say uh, on behalf of the North American Mission Board, thank you so much for being a faithful church uh, to the cooperative program. I love how Southern Baptists, we can do more together than we can separate, amen? And the way that we cooperate our funds, uh, we see the gospel proclaimed across this country and across this world. So thank you for your giving uh, to the Annie Armstrong uh, offering as well as the Lottie Moon offering uh, as we support our missionaries. Uh, and we are so thankful for you. Um, as I thought about what to do, uh, what, what, what passage we would study this morning and the theme of disciple, where we was, as a church body would spend time this morning, God brought me to Matthew chapter 28. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me there to Matthew chapter 28. And when I think about the theme of, of being a disciple as we studied this weekend with the students, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? There's, there's no greater passage for us to study this morning than some of the last words of Jesus. Jesus, the call to make disciples, the Great Commission. And so I know if you're a believer and you, you've walked with Jesus for some years, this is a familiar passage for you. You may have heard it before. You may actually know it by heart. But my, my prayer for each of us uh, is that we would study this passage fresh and anew this morning, that God would speak to us. And I would ask that as you approach this this morning, as you hear the word of the Lord uh, together this morning, that we would uh, hear it fresh. Well, we need to understand the context of this passage. What's taking place in this passage uh, before we approach it? There's, there's lots of things that give us the backdrop of the Great Commission in the life and ministry of Jesus that, that impact the way we read this passage. So what are, what are some things that have taken place in the, the few chapters coming up to Matthew 28? Well, we see that Jesus himself was arrested illegally. He was uh, arrested at night, and, and we know that, that scenario, that scene of what takes place. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and Judas comes up to him. It's at night. Jesus is there praying, and, and he betrays Jesus with a kiss, and he's arrested illegally. And then there's the trials that were, that were uh, uh, deceived. Uh, they were, they were uh, manipulated to be in, in uh, uh, convict Jesus. They were not fair trials. We see Jesus was, was orchestrated to be arrested and to be put in prison. He was beaten. He was mocked. You remember the story of Jesus before Pilate. And Pilate doesn't really know what to do with Jesus. He, he feels like Jesus is innocent. And he asks the crowds, who do you want? I'll, I'll release for you somebody. And the options were Barabbas or Jesus. And, and that, that heartbreaking story of the crowds choosing Barabbas over Jesus. Jesus, he's, he's beaten. He's He's arrested, he's mocked, and then he takes the cross. 
and, and walks it up Calvary Hill and is crucified. Jesus is dead. And you find yourself thinking about what would, you, what would you do in that situation? You're a disciple of Jesus. You've walked with Jesus for three years. You've, you've seen him say things that, man, they're kind of crazy. You see him do things that maybe only could be done by God's son, but he's, he's dead. And you begin to ask this question, who really was Jesus? We find ourselves in the beginning of Chapter 28, I want you to read this passage with me. This answers the question, who really was Jesus? And it sets for us the backdrop of the Great Commission. So if you have your Bibles, look there with me. Matthew 28, starting in verse 1, God's word says this. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And the fear of him, uh, excuse me, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not fear, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. And here's the good news for us this morning. He is not here, for he has risen. Come and see the place where he lay. Think about where the disciples were. They were wondering, who was this Jesus? And then, and then for us as the church, we know the reality, the truth of what took place. Jesus was crucified, but on the third day he resurrected. And who is this Jesus? Jesus truly is the Son of God. He is God's Son. He's the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And the answer to that question is a resounding yes, he is the promised Messiah. Yes, he is the Son of God. And this weekend we've looked at the reality that disciples of Jesus see Jesus for who he really is. We don't think Jesus is just a good teacher. He's not an accessory to our life. He's not a piece of jewelry. Jesus is our everything. Jesus is the King of kings, and Jesus is the Lord of lords. And for those of us who walk with him and follow him, we believe that truly is who Jesus is. But if we believe that, these next words become very important to us. These next words, some of the final words of Jesus are extremely important So let's approach, with that backdrop, let's approach the Great Commission together. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, God's word says this. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we come before you proclaiming that we know who Jesus is. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He's the one who's radically changed our lives. We're a new creation because of the work of Jesus. And so, Jesus, we come before you this morning wanting to hear from you. We want want you to speak to us. We want to hear your words, and we want to be obedient to you. God, give us us a, a fresh understanding of what it means to be a disciple of you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of this message this morning is The Litmus Test of a Disciple. The Litmus Test of a Disciple. And I'll be honest with you, I'm really quite terrible at science. Um, In fact, I've moved many times in my life, so my transcript was was really, really complicated. And and I'll be honest with you, it's actually okay, because I've graduated high school now, so they can't go ahead and take my diploma, but I don't have enough science credits, if I'm honest with you. 
Uh, I remember being there at high school graduation, and I, I spent uh, 15 years in Canada, so they do school a little bit different there. And, and so I got to the U.S., and the guidance, the guidance counselor told me, he's like, I've never seen a more messed up transcript, but we're going we're gonna to get you to graduate. We're going to do that. And I remember being there at high school graduation, and you hear that superintendent say those magical words, I certify that each of these graduates have everything they need to walk across the stage tonight, right? And I'm sitting there, praise the Lord. I, you know, I don't think I have four sciences, but praise the Lord. I'm not good at science. But, but there's one thing I remember about science. It was when we would do a litmus test. Maybe you remember with me. What does a litmus test do? It's this little strip of paper, and you put it into a substance, and it tells you how alkaline or how acidic a substance is, right? It, it gives you some information about the nature and the character of that substance, I would propose to you this morning that the Great Commission is the litmus test of a disciple. That what you and I do with the Great Commission tells us what we think about Jesus. And the way that we handle some of the last words of our Savior tell us how, how are, we, are we oriented or postured before King Jesus. That if we take these words seriously, if we obey these words, we're a true disciple of Jesus. What you do with the Great Commission is what you're doing with Jesus. We can't come before him and set the terms of our obedience. We come before him and we hear his words and obey. Over and over and over in the gospels, Jesus calls his followers to hear and what? Obey. The Great Commission is a litmus test for our true belief in Jesus. And obedience to Jesus is obedience to the Great Commission. Well, this morning, we're going to look at four components of the Great Commission, four components of the Great Commission. The first is the authority of the Great Commission. Look with me in verse 18. God's word says this, and Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You know, the the way we respond to a request changes based on the authority of the request, doesn't it? I've uh, started to uh, pay my own bills now. I'm, I'm growing up a little bit. I'm stepping out from under my parents, and uh, it's a part of adulting as you, you start to pay your own bills. And I remember when I got my first medical bills. Maybe you remember that feeling before. I was really quite confident that I'd paid those medical bills. I remember looking at the amount and looking at the date, and I was like, no, 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 we paid a bill that was that date. I, I know what I'm doing. I really paid this bill. And they, they kept sending these bills. And I'm like, well, that's weird. I really, I'm really quite confident I paid that. Well, then I got a bill one day from the collections agency, right? And I responded very differently to that bill than I did the hospital bill. We do this within relationships too. Maybe it's, it's an acquaintance of yours. You respond differently to the way they ask you to do something than your boss, right? Or, or maybe it's a best friend of yours and that distant cousin. The way, the way you answer that, the way you respond to the request changes based on their authority, based on the relationship you have with them. As we approach this commission this morning, it's so important for us to understand that the great commission is given by the one who has all authority. Jesus, while he's on earth, it's this this really unique combination of of him being in the flesh, being man, and being the son of God. He's he's got authority. He he raises people from the dead. He he multiplies the fish to feed 5,000, but he's he's, he's kind of in some ways not the Jesus that will be just at the right hand of the Father. He's somewhat limited by his human status. The Apostle Paul says that he was humbly took on the form of a servant. But, but the Jesus that we see who is here at the Great Commission, this is, this is the risen Christ. This is the Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father. This is the Christ who spoke all things into existence, who Paul says is the agent of creation, who sustains all things. And he gives you and I a commission, friends. He calls us to action. And these are some of his last words. He could have said anything, but this is what he said. We see the authority of the Great Commission. But we also see the action of the Great Commission. Let's read verse 19 together. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. When we study this passage, we see there's one command 
or one imperative in this passage. That there's, there's several verbs, but there's one that sticks out above all of them. The one that, that has the main emphasis of the passage, and that command is to make disciples. The Great Commission has, has one command, but it has three verbs that surround it that describe how we fulfilled this command. And I love this about God's word. It, it gives us instruction, doesn't it? It tells us how we're supposed to do something. God doesn't leave us without his instruction, without his, his word that guides us. And so Jesus, he makes a command to make disciples, and then he gives his disciples instruction on how to fulfill this command. He says, make disciples. I think you and I would agree this world needs more disciples of Jesus. This world desperately needs Jesus, doesn't it? Every time we turn on the news, every time we, we open up to some, some kind of social media platform, we're reminded of the reality of brokenness and sin. And as we think about our culture, you, you and I, maybe because of, of what we believe and what we hold dear, we're, we're lamenting culture when we see culture, don't we? As I prepare to plant in Boston, I think about what's going on in that city, the things that, that are the worldview and the heartbeat of that city. And friend, I am grieved by some of the things that take place. But as I think about what, what I'm called to do, as I think about what God wants to see happen in the city of Boston, he wants to see change. But friend, while politics and policy are great and they're good things, culture will not ultimately be changed without the power of Jesus. How, how is culture changed? Culture is changed by the people who reflect Jesus. Culture is changed by changed people who proclaim the good news of Christ into culture. And so here, here's where I find myself sometimes. I'm lamenting culture. I'm saying, man, I really wish it wouldn't be like this. Man, this is terrible. I cannot believe these things are happening. And yet I fail to obey the command to make disciples. Let's not find ourselves there, friend. God calls us to make disciples. He calls us to be the change, to be the people that represent Jesus, and the gospel of Jesus Christ changes culture. Well, what is a disciple? A disciple is a student of Jesus who follows Jesus. A disciple is somebody who studies the life of Jesus, who, who looks at the model of Christ and, and who studies it so that they can be like Jesus and follow Jesus. Jesus spends his last moments with his followers to call them to one task, and that's to make disciples. Here's what he's asking them to do, to teach people to follow Jesus, and then those people will teach people to follow Jesus. Our theme verse this weekend, you can see on our shirts, is 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. And here's what this says. And this is Paul speaking to Timothy. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You see, Paul was radically transformed by Jesus. We know that story. And what did Paul do with his life? He invested it in others. He came across this guy named Timothy. Timothy was just a young guy, but, but Paul invested his life in him. And guess what happened to Timothy? Timothy became a pastor, and, and Timothy decided to invest his lives in others. And, and you see this verse. You see what takes place here. There's four generations of discipleship. There's four levels, four generations of people investing their lives and making disciples and people being transformed by the gospel. There's no greater investment you and I can make than making disciples. How are you spending your time? How are you orienting your life? Is it around the message and the ministry of Jesus? Are you investing your life in making disciples? The reality is that's God's strategy for changing the world. Jesus says, make disciples, and then he gives some more instructions alongside that. He doesn't just leave it there. He says, make disciples of who? Of all nations. This literally is translated all ethnicities. This, this commission, the, the great commission, is a global command. Because of that, it, it, it can't be fulfilled by local bodies like this one, just in their own city. The, the great commission cannot be fulfilled by your obedience just in Clovis. 
The Great Commission is fulfilled when we have a, have a desire to get the gospel to places it's never been. Get the gospel to places, to people groups who have never heard the good news of Jesus. That's why in Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit comes and the church is birthed, uh, excuse me, that's, that's before Pentecost, but in Acts 1.8, the foretelling of, Jesus, of the Holy Spirit coming, it says that, that we'll be empowered to be witnesses where? It says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The reality is that God's heart is for all people to know him. That tribe in South America that right now has never even heard the name of Jesus. God's heart is for them to know him. That neighbor of yours that's across the street that you don't know, that you know you need to get, get in contact with, you, you know you need to introduce yourself to, maybe, maybe they're living without the hope of Jesus in their life. Friend, God cares for them just like he does the person in South America. God's heart is for all people to know him. JoshuaProject.net is a resource where they research uh, um, unreached people groups. And right now, according to them, there are 7.7 billion people on the earth. And of those 7.7 billion people, 3.1 billion people live in an unreached people group. What does that mean? It means that as we sit here in our chairs this morning, those people have no access to the gospel. They've never heard the name Jesus. So friends, when we think about the Great Commission, we think about what God calls us to do, may we be people who, who are gl- uh, responding to the global command, the global call to make disciples. The Great Commission launched the birth of the global church. If we read the book of Acts, we see what happens. It, it couldn't just be contained in Jerusalem. In fact, it spread and it spread and it spread. And today, you and I are a part of a global church and we have more work to do. We also see, in addition to the action of the Great Commission, the circumstances of the Great Commission. Look in verses 19 and 20 with me. God says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The Great Commission contains three circumstances that fulfill the command. So so Jesus gives instruction, make disciples. That's what I'm calling you to do with your life. Make disciples. But here's how you do that, and he gives them three verbs that, that, that allow us to see how we do that, the circumstances that fulfill the Great Commission. But one thing that we need to notice about this as well is that this was given to all the disciples, Jesus didn't look at this, this room and say, hey, um, you know what, you're, you're really outgoing, so why don't you come over here, um, and you're, you're uh, really naturally gifted in evangelism, so why don't you come over here. You guys, you're called to make disciples. It's not what he did. He looked at a room filled with people that have all kinds of different gifts and talents, spiritual gifts diverse in the room, stories diverse in the room, people who were Jewish, people who weren't Jewish. I mean, just, just a ragtag group of people that love him. He looks at them, each, all of them, and he says, go and make disciples. As we approach this, we've got to understand this is not just for pastors. This is not just for missionaries. This is for every follower of Jesus. We see there's circumstances of the Great Commission. The first is Go. Jesus starts it by saying, go, and and literally it's translated as you're going. The reality is making disciples requires movement. You know, you're you're never going to wake up one day and find yourself sitting down with your Bible open across from somebody that maybe knows less about about Christ than you. They haven't been walking with Jesus as long as you have. You're never going to find yourself just sitting there making disciples. Nobody will make disciples without intentionality. Nobody will make disciples without setting out to to plan to be around, invest your life in other people. It takes intentionality. But here's the cool thing. You can leverage your daily rhythms. I love how it's translated. It's literally translated as you're going. 
So so here's what obedience to this looks like. Sometimes it means that we go across the world. It means that we actually, we we, we take our, our lives and we plant them somewhere else that desperately needs the gospel. It means that we go. But it also means that we do it as we're going. So, so where are some places that you go uh, throughout your week? You, you probably go to the grocery store. You, you probably go to maybe the park and walk your dog. Or maybe, maybe you go uh, to and from a local coffee shop. Or you maybe run some errands in a nearby city. Guess what God wants you to do with your life? He wants you to use those things to make disciples. What would it look like for you to leverage your weekly rhythms to invest in other people, to teach them how to walk with Jesus. Maybe you got to go to Lubbock to run some errands, and there's a guy or a girl in your Sunday school class or, or a couple, and, and you know they've not been walking with Jesus as long as you have, and, and you would like to invest in them, and, and, and you feel like you could bless them by getting to know them, and, and maybe, maybe telling them what your, your life with Jesus has been like, and you said, you know what, hey, why don't you go with, with me to Lubbock? I'm going go to to go run some errands. Why don't you go with me? And you just have casual conversation about what it looks like to walk with Jesus. Friend, you and I can use our daily rhythms to make disciples. For some of us, obedience is going across the world. But for all of us, obedience is using our week. It's using our daily rhythms. The first circumstance is going. The second is baptizing. See what Jesus says. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here's what we know about baptism. Baptism requires gospel proclamation. We don't show up this morning and and we decide, I'd like to get rebaptized, right? We we don't get baptized multiple times because we feel like we need to be blessed by God. Baptism happens once for us. It happens when we are transformed by the message of the gospel. And we say that we're no longer the same. We want to illustrate the new life that's taken place. And we want to proclaim our first sermon, right? That's what baptism is. Jesus, you've changed me. But we know that happens after conversion. Happens after you respond to the message of the gospel. See what happens in Acts 2, verses 37 and 38. Peter has just preached a message to the Jews that are surrounding him. And and hear what happens. It says this. Now, when they all heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them two things. Repent and be baptized each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus in the Great Commission, he's instructing his disciples to share the good news of Jesus, to proclaim the gospel, the realities of what Christ has done in your life and the truth of who he is, and to see people come to faith and to be baptized. Just like you can leverage your everyday rhythms to invest in people, you can leverage your everyday rhythms to share the good news of Jesus. Disciples of Jesus are burdened for the lost. We recognize that there's people in our, in our lives that don't know Jesus, and we want to be around them, and we want to know them, we want to have them in our homes, we want to eat with them, we want to spend time with them, we want to invest in them. That's, that's the heartbeat of what Jesus did. He went after the lost, and friend, this is what God calls us to do, to share the good news of Jesus. Maybe this might look like you every Monday morning. Maybe you're on your, on your way to work, praying a simple prayer. Jesus, let me share you this week. Give me an opportunity to interact with somebody who maybe just had a really hard day, and, and Holy Spirit, prompt me to share the good news of Jesus. This is what Jesus was calling his disciples to do. Go baptize. And the third circumstance of the Great Commission is teaching. Jesus told his disciples to teach them all that I have commanded you. And here's the reality. Teaching requires investment. It requires investment. It requires time. It requires sacrifice. And and then we see the reward of our investment. We see people growing to be more and more like Jesus. And here's how God intended it to be, that that you and I would be disciple makers because we can't get over the fact that we're disciples of Jesus, that we can't get over the fact that, that God has radically changed our life, 
that we're not the same, that we have passion and purpose and joy and that we're not bound by our sin, that we can walk in freedom and and Jesus has transformed our life and out of that truth and out of that reality of, of who Jesus is, we get to pour the overflow of that into somebody else's life. I love what happened in Peter and John is in Acts chapter 4, they're, they're arrested and they're brought before the council, the same council that put Jesus to death. They're facing certain death. And what do we know about the apostles? They, they all died for their faith. And Jesus, excuse me, John and Peter before the council, they're asked, they're charged, no longer speak about the name of Jesus. And this was Peter's response. I cannot help but speak of what I've seen and what I've heard. I pray that's true in my life. I pray that's true in your life, that no matter the circumstances, we're not perfect, we're not going to be perfect. There's there's no way you and I aren't going to mess up, but you know what we can do? We can be faithful. We can be faithful. When we mess up, we can refocus and we can, we can pursue Jesus. We can follow Jesus with our lives. And I hope and pray for me and for you that we can't help but speak of what we've seen and what we've heard. The good news of Jesus. And as we think about the call to make disciples, it happens as we cannot get over the fact that we're a disciple of Jesus. That we get to, to follow the King of kings and Lord of lords. That he's restored us and redeemed us. And because of that, we want to make more disciples. You know, today, in our generation, in our day, in 2020, we have more access to the Bible than any time in history. I just you think about investing your life in other people, there are so many resources, free resources, that you can use today. How are you and I being good stewards of our access to the Word today? The Great Commission calls us to go, calls us to baptize, and it calls us to teach. But the fourth reality of the Great Commission, the the component of the Great Commission, is the promise of the Great Commission. Look at verse 20. Jesus says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I love how Jesus does this. He, he gives a command and, and he gives instruction. He gives us a, a, a roadmap how to fulfill the command that he's given us. And then before he leaves, he tells the disciples, guess what? I will be with you. I won't leave you. I, I promise you, you'll have my presence. So this means that when you and I are, are about to have a conversation with somebody and, and we're kind of nervous about it, we're about to maybe walk over and meet that neighbor that's there that you know you should get to know, you know doesn't know the hope of Christ and you're about to walk over there and you're about to say the first words of, of your story, guess who's with you? Jesus. That when, when you're about to interact with somebody that, that you know needs to hear the good news of Christ, guess who is beside you? Guess who empowers you? Guess who supports you? Guess who's working through your life? It's Jesus. So disciples of Christ are not left to fulfill the mission on our own. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, and we have the work of Jesus in our lives. You know, I think about the beginning of the church in the book of Acts. I think about what it looked like for somebody to hear the good news of Christ right right when the church started. Can you imagine that scene? In Acts chapter 1, there's 120 people. By Acts chapter 5, there's approximately 10,000 people in this church that's birthing. Can you imagine what's taking place? And people responding to the good news of Jesus. They're hearing the good news of Jesus. And God is transforming their life. And guess what they're doing? They're sharing the good news of Jesus. They're investing in other people. And we see this this chain throughout history that is somebody hearing the good news of Christ and telling people about the good news of Jesus. Robbie Gallaty says it this way in his book Growing Up. The gospel came to you so it can get to someone else. As I think about my life, I don't want to be that chain that's not linked. I don't want to be that chain that I've received such good investment. People have invested in me. By God's sovereignty and his mercy, he sent somebody to tell me about Jesus. It was my parents. And by God's sovereignty and his mercy, he told somebody to to go and to tell the good news of Jesus to my parents. And guess what? In his sovereignty and his mercy, he's calling me 
to tell people about Jesus. Friend, he's calling you. He's calling you to make disciples with your life. Bill Hull says this about discipleship. Discipleship isn't a program or an event. It's a way of life. It's not for a limited time, but for a whole life. Discipleship isn't for beginners. It's for all believers for every day of their life. Discipleship isn't just one of the things the church does. It is what the church does. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for the good news of Jesus. The reality is, God, that you never leave us where you found us. That we get to respond to the death, burial, and yes, resurrection of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God, I pray if there's anybody in this room this morning who's asking that question, who really is Jesus? I pray this morning, God, through your spirit, you'd speak to them that Jesus is the Son of God who laid down his life for their sin, and today they can respond in obedience. God, the rest of us who know you, I pray that we'd respond to the call to make disciples and make that investment with our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.